Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for session three of the Hartford Business Journal and New Haven Biz webcast series. My name is Greg Bordnero, and I'm the editor of the Hartford Business Journal, and I'll be your host and moderator for this virtual event, which will focus on helping business decision makers better understand what's happening with the second round of funding under the federal government's Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP. As you may know, Congress last week approved an additional $310 billion in funding for PPP, which provides low interest and potentially forgivable loans to small businesses with fewer than 500 employees to keep workers on their payrolls. That money became available starting Monday at 10 a.m. During the initial $350 billion round of PPP funding, more than 18,000 applications from small businesses in Connecticut were approved for loans totaling about $4.1 billion. Our aim today is to get you up to speed and where things stand right now with the second round of PPP. If you've already applied or are planning to apply, we wanna answer your questions or tell you where to get those answers. And we have assembled a team of experts who are all on the front lines of dealing with this program. I'd like to start off today by thanking our sponsors who helped make this virtual event possible and who are also playing key roles in helping small businesses get through the crisis. Thank you to our platinum sponsor, Webster Bank. With $27 billion in assets, Webster is the second largest Connecticut-based bank, and it provides commercial, middle market, and commercial real estate lending, business and consumer banking, mortgage, financial planning, trust, and investment services through over 160 banking centers. Webster also provides mobile and internet banking for its customers. Thank you, Webster Bank, for your support. Thank you to our silver sponsor, Whittlesey. Founded in Hartford in 1961, Whittlesey is one of the largest regional CPA and consulting firms in New England. With offices in Connecticut and Massachusetts, the firm provides a comprehensive array of advisory, assurance, tax, and technology services to a broad range of businesses, organizations, and individuals. And thank you to our event sponsor, Robinson & Cole. We've got representatives of our sponsors as part of our panel today, who I'll introduce in just a moment. We also have two other special guests joining us SBA Regional Administrator Wendell Davis and David Lehman, Commissioner of the State Department of Economic and Community Development, who will share their perspectives on the PPP and the state of the Connecticut economy. Our other participants today include Tim Bergstrom. He's the Regional President for the Hartford Market for Webster Bank, which is still filing loans on behalf of its customers. Tim, welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you. We also have Taylor Shea, a partner at law firm Robinson & Cole. Taylor represents privately and publicly held companies in corporate and transactional law, including commercial finance transactions, private equity and venture capital transactions, mergers and acquisitions, and general corporate and commercial matters. Taylor, welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here with you all this afternoon. And finally, I'd like to welcome Drew Andrews. He's the managing partner and CEO of Whittlesey. Drew is responsible for developing and executing firm strategy, and under his leadership, the firm has experienced significant growth, doubling revenue, and expanding geographically with three offices across Connecticut and Massachusetts. Welcome, Drew. Thanks for having me. Our webinar today will run for about 50 minutes to 60 minutes, and we'll start off by talking to uh, Wendell Davis, the regional administrator from the SBA. Wendell, good afternoon. Hey, Greg. Hey, thanks for having me on, and uh, I appreciate this opportunity. You know, I, th I think it's appropriate now that run round one is over and we're amidst round two to kind of take stock in what happened in round one and, 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 you know, ask the question, did it hit its mark? And, you know, for me, from my perspective, where I did, uh, it absolutely did, and I, and I truly believe it was a resounding success. When you look at the overall numbers of the 1.6 million applications, 1.2 million of those applications went for loan requests of $150,000 or less. 87% of all uh, uh, applicants and small business owners, the loan request was under and approved for $350,000 or less. 1 million of those 1.6 million went to businesses with under 10 employees. So notwithstanding some of the press reports out there, you know, this did reach small business America. And, and to kind of put the number, the Connecticut numbers perspective that you had mentioned earlier, the 18,000 loans in Connecticut for $4.1 billion. Put that in perspective, in the last fiscal year, complete year for the SBA, the SBA through its flagship 7A program did $220 million over the entire course of the year 
hitting 700 businesses, and that was considered a resounding success. So when you compare that with the 12 and a half days where four billion was put on the streets of Connecticut, I mean, it's a remarkable feat. Wendell, can you get us caught up on where are we with the second round of PPP funding? How much money has been allocated so far? And do you have a sense of how long the money might last? Yeah, so as of this morning, so these are morning numbers and any number from the morning when you're in the afternoon is an old number. But the morning number, we were at $80 billion. Um, the total funding, I think everybody, you know, is the $310 billion, but some of that, there's a portion of that, I think, don't hold me to this, but I think it was $30 billion that's been set aside for the CDFIs, and, which I think is an important uh, change in the program. Uh, so when you look at that $80 billion at 1030 today, we're two days into this. I think folks can do the math. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to last. The, the, the round one went, it lasted about 12 and a half days. And, you know, you guys, I think all can do the math on that. Sure. And you were talking about some of the sort of the media reports so far, and, and there were some media reports still out today about some technical glitches um, that occurred with the rollout of the second round of, of PPP. What's the status of any technical glitches? What happened and have they been worked out at this point? Yeah, Greg, um, I like to call them hiccups because hip, hiccups go away. And, it, sure. and indeed, those hiccups did go away in this instance Monday. I think in response to some of the other media reports of some entities getting loans that, you know, maybe shouldn't have gotten those loans, the SBA decided to pace the loan program and pace the approvals. So everything that came in, um, it, it was, I want to call it bumper guards were put on it. And, and they want to make sure there's equal footing. So one of the results after day one and day two is that community and local banks have outpaced the larger banks in terms of the billions of dollars that they've, they've been approved for so far. Uh, so that was an important objective of the SBA to make sure there was an equal footing early on. And because they knew that there was this incredible pent up uh, demand and applications that the bank, the banks and the lenders kept accumulating over that week pause that we had until round two funding came in. So also just in terms of the stress on the system. So I think it was a function of two things. One, pacing the loans as they came through the system, but also the stress on the system. So on Monday morning, when all of those applications hit the SBA system, the numbers were double anything that occurred in round one. So round one was unprecedented for the SBA and round two was double of what they experienced in round one. But I'm happy to say that Tuesday was better than Monday. Wednesday, today, been better than Tuesday. My volume of emails that I've gotten from lenders saying what the heck is going on is virtually dropped to almost zero. And, and the lenders are, are, are getting these applications in and, we're, and the SBA is approving them at a rapid pace right now. I'm going to knock on wood now that I said that. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, in the wake of some large public company, publicly traded companies getting PPP loans, the SBA and, and Treasury actually announced this morning that they'll start to review loans in excess of, of $2 million in addition to other loans as appropriate. Could you talk about a little bit about what that means for potential borrowers and have any eligibility rules changed at all since the first round? Yeah, first, let me say it's unfortunate on a couple different levels. It's unfortunate that some of those funds were temporarily diverted to entities that are probably pretty well capitalized. Uh, but it was also unfortunate because I think it detracted from some of the statistics that I gave you earlier about how this really is reaching small business America. And, and one of the things that came out of that was some, not only what you referenced, but there was some guidance issued by Treasury and the SBA regarding the certification. So when a company goes into and certifies that they've been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, the Treasury and the SBA kind of emphasize, hey, it also has to be necessary. So if you have existing capital, if you have existing funds or your parent has existing funds, then you know you gotta be really careful when you certify that. It has to impact you and you can't have essentially cash on hand. Uh, so I think that's been the res response to that. Just to also put that in perspective in terms of all of those press reports, of the 1.6 million loans in round one, approximately 4,400 went to um, uh, small businesses or applicants. Um, only 4,400 went were, were for more than $5 million. 
Uh, again, that's out of 1.6 million. So you're talking about a pretty small universe. And I would gather to say, and I don't have the micro data on this, but of the four, of the 4,400 uh, uh, businesses in that pool, I would venture to say that many of those are critical manufacturers, wholesalers, and other entities that desperately needed those funds. Sure. Were, were there any other major changes uh, related to the second round of PPP funding uh, that businesses should, should know about? Or, or did the rules pretty much stay the same? Yeah, I think the, the rules overall are still coming out. A couple of, out a couple of there, were, there were some changes. Let me just highlight a couple and Taylor may be able to add to this uh, later on. But one, I did mention the CDFIs, so there's going to be an allotment. It's either 20 or, or $30 billion for CDFIs. And, and those are folks that are really focused in on on small communities, underserved markets. So I'm, that program hasn't, uh, the rules behind that haven't been clearly defined, which I actually think is a good thing because I think we need a little bit of runway so we can get out there and reach those communities and make sure that not only are we hitting small businesses, but we're hitting the small of the small uh, businesses. The second thing is rural. There's some more defin definitions around rural uh, businesses and it's really opened it up to make it clear that rural businesses are eligible. Uh, so it expanded that. I think those were two of a couple different changes, but two critically important changes in the program. Sure. And how would you assess the enthusiasm among Connecticut banks for the second round of PPP uh, program funding? Have, have any lenders dropped out? Have you seen more lenders come into the program in Connecticut? I'm not aware. I'm not aware of any lenders that have dropped out. I know our numbers have gone up by over 700 banks in the last week. So we're over 5,000 I can't even remember what the number is, but it's over 5,000 banks. I mean, the banks and lenders in Connecticut have been amazing. Without them, this doesn't work, right? It's a, it's a public-private partnership. And the SBA, in my view, plays a very small ro role in that. The, the lenders and the bankers, and I know we have uh, Webster Bank on the line, uh, they're killing it out there. They're getting out there. They're reaching their communities and their neighborhoods and the small businesses in, the, in, in their communities. and. And they've been incredible. That and also, I know we have Commissioner Lehman on the phone. I mean, working with the state of Connecticut it has been seamless and they've been great to work with and incredibly responsive. As we try to help as many small businesses as we can. Sure. And, and uh, you know, a question on a lot of people's minds who are on this call right now who haven't applied. Is there still time to apply and what would you recommend to them? Yeah, I know last time... When, when you asked me that question, I said, apply, apply, apply. And like three hours later, we were out. Yeah. Um, we're at 80 billion right now. Again, that's an early morning number. So that's changed since uh, the morning. Um, so there, it might do, I'm going to knock on wood. There is time. Get out there, apply, reach out, reach out to your lender. Um, again, it's not just small businesses. I, I want to emphasize because st I still think there's some confusion out there whether or not sole proprietors can get loans. They absolutely can. Independent contractors can get loans. So it's very broad. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Conne the Connecticut SBA district office or talk to you, a lender in your community, and, and make sure uh, that if you are eligible, you're taking advantage of the program. Sure. All right, Wendell, thank you for that. We'll, we'll get back to you with more questions a little bit later in the, in the program. Um, okay. Now we're going to check in with uh, DECD Commissioner David Lehman. David, good afternoon. Hey, how are you? Sorry, it took me a second to unmute myself there. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for taking some time today. So I guess, you know, the first question I wanted to ask you was, can you start off by telling us where Connecticut is right now? Uh, in terms of the economic shutdown and where you think where you think things are headed in terms of the reopening of the economy. Yeah, um, of course. So, you know, and we actually just got some data this morning at the national level where uh, Q Q1 annualized GDP was down 5%, which is the worst uh, that I think the country's seen since the financial crisis. Obviously, we expect Q2 to be worse based on uh, the, the lack of uh, commerce and the lockdown rules that have been in place here and elsewhere. You know, we think potentially you can see uh, an annualized number for those two quarters around negative 10% for the year. Uh, it's obviously tough to tell. I think the best case uh, GDP level data we have right now is at the national level. I can talk through some of the metrics and the dashboard we're looking at here in Connecticut, but that's the that, that's kind of where I think we see it. And we're hopeful it'll be a significant rebound in Q3 and Q4, but there's, there's no playbook for this crisis. So anyone who tells you they know what's happening uh, doesn't because we've never seen this before. 
Um, a couple of things I would just mention, Greg. So OPM, from a state level, we did put out some updated information where we expect uh, revenues to be roughly half a billion dollars for this fiscal year that ends at June 30th versus what we previously expected. And then tomorrow at the end of the day, the state's going to put out uh, anticipated revenues for the out years. So we'll have some more information in terms of what we think the impact could be in the look through to the state finances. You know, obviously we're looking at jobless claims on, on a regular basis and there's been over 400,000 jobless claims. If you look at Connecticut versus other states, just on that metric, you know, it looks like we have some of the, the higher unemployment claims, uh, certainly relative to our labor force. You know, I think there are potentially some duplicates in there. So we'll, we'll see how that ultimately translates to the labor force and the unemployment rate, um, you know, when things settle down a little bit. But Commissioner Westby and his team continue to work through that but it's certainly possible you could have an unemployment rate that is at, uh, we're approaching 20% here. A couple other metrics we look at, if traffic on the roads of Connecticut's down roughly 50%, bus ridership for that mass transit vehicle is down roughly 50%, and some of the train lines have seen an excess of 90% ridership down. So you have seen a, a pretty considerable drop off in, in economic activity and people moving as a result of stay safe, stay home. Last thing I would just mention on this point is we, we were, when Governor Lamont was crafting his uh, stay home order, you know, we, we, we try to be very thoughtful in terms of allowing certain businesses to remain open. Uh, so, you know, two of the uh, obvious examples is we, we basically deemed the entire manufacturing chain in the state essential, understanding how complex some of those supply chains are uh, for manufacturers. So that is different than some of our peers. And construction is another example where we, we've let construction be open the whole time uh, and other states have not. So we've really tried to be thoughtful to not stop a big portion of our economy. Obviously, the, the public health lens is the main lens we're looking at this through, but we realize Connecticut's its own state and, and we wanted to be thoughtful. And I'll talk a bit more about reopen later if that's all right, but I'll, I'll stop there in terms of the current economic outlook. Yeah, sure. Well, let's, let's go into, I know you're on the, the your reopening advisory committee. Where do things stand with that and sort of what's the blueprint right now or the thought process on, on reopening uh, the, the economy? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I probably spend, you know, rough, roughly 80% uh, of my time now, maybe even 90% of my time now on reopening. And, and, you know, go back two or three weeks, it was probably 80 or 90% of my time on triage. So it's been, uh, it, you know, we, we think the, the kind of three stages of this are one, respond. And you've seen a lot of the executive orders for helping business and individuals in the state as the governors look to respond to the crisis. Second is reopen. And that's really where we are right now. The governor is going to be announcing a bunch more on that tomorrow with uh, Indra Nui and Albert Coe, who are the co-chairs of that, uh, that advisory group. And really leading up to that May 20th date, we're, we're spending a significant amount of time with various industries, both open and those have, that have been really impacted by the crisis and, and affected their business, talking about how they can reopen, when they can reopen, what are the right protocols that need to be in place, what's the communication strategy from a consumer perspective. You know, for example, Greg, we've seen a lot of data that said even if the state said, you know, we're reopened tomorrow, turn the lights back on, you know, there's a good portion of consumers, some studies suggest up to 50%, that are still very wary and, and wouldn't go to that retail store, or that restaurant. So a big portion of this is making sure that we have the right strategy and monitoring to make sure our, our people not only are safe, but they believe themselves to be safe and they feel safe. And that's going to be a big part of it. But we're, we're spending a, a lot of time on this and you'll hear more from the governor tomorrow night uh, and then throughout the next couple of weeks as we look to reopen the state. Sure. And I know there, there is some confusion. You know, a lot of people think, okay, May 20th, that might be a time when, when things begin to reopen. But then Indra Nui, um, I think it was last week or early this week, said she doesn't picture the Indra Nui, the former PepsiCo uh, CEO who's on the advisory board, um, mentioned that, you know, May 20th is more of a deadline for a report and recommendations and that the economy may not reopen until sometime in June. Is that, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, listen, I would say it's, a, it, it, it's, it's something where there's been a bit of movement. And, and what I mean by that is I, I, I think we shouldn't think about it as a, as a given date. We understand we need to give a heads up to businesses that are going to reopen. You know, they can't just do it on 24 or 48 hours notice. A absolutely. But at the same time, what the governor put forth are clear guidelines, for example, 14 days of, of declining hospitalizations and making sure that the, the prevalence of flu-like system symptoms and COVID symptoms you know, are declining over that time period as one of the uh, parameters in addition to making sure we have the right PPE testing, et cetera. So I, I think we want to do this as soon as possible. I just think we need to, to manage, you know, the folks and make sure folks know that it's, it's not, it's not going to be on a specific date per se right now. We're going to, we're going to try to do this as quickly as we can and as soon as we responsibly can. 
I think some of the quotes at the press conference last week got taken a little bit out of context because we're, we're trying to move as, as quickly as possible, but it's going to be data dependent, I think is the main message. Sure. And before we move on to the, the next part of the program, what is the, the status of the state's uh, bridge loan program that was rolled out um, in the immediate aftermath of this, this crisis starting in Connecticut? Yeah, so on, on the state program, we actually, I uh, was just on a call earlier, we're, we're finalizing uh, allocations on that today, and we expect to communicate uh, what we call conditional approvals with loan amounts either later this afternoon or tomorrow. You know, there, there was considerably more demand for that program, even with the upsize from 25 to 50 million. Um, so we're, we're going to be making a lot of loans, um, several thousand loans, but there are going to be, uh, the, the loan amounts are going to be smaller than I think what, what folks were initially asking for, given the constraint around the 50 million. But we're going to, we're going to hope to communicate all that later today or tomorrow. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, David. We'll, we'll talk to you a few more questions later in the program. Um, for the, for the next part of this webinar, we have asked our three other speakers to share three takeaways uh, from the second round of PPP funding. Afterwards, we'll open up the discussion for Q&A. Many of our attendees have sent us questions in advance that we'll be asking. Listeners, feel free to also submit questions via the Q&A button on your screen as the conversation is happening. Uh, let's start off with Tim Bergstrom from Webster Bank. Tim? Oh, thanks, Greg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you. You know, this PPP has been one of the most anticipated and is certainly, I think, one of the most demand in-demand programs. You know, it's being talked about in the media. It's being talked about in the business community. And, you know, again, keeping in mind that this is designed to keep businesses running and keep their employees on the payroll, most uh, first and foremost. Um, as was mentioned, um, you know, these loans are made through banks and carry 100% guarantee from the Small Business Administration. You know, we don't want to spend a lot of time here talking about the details of PPP because it's pretty widely known by now. Um, you know, we'll get to, in my remarks, and I want to get to things like, you know, what do businesses need to know now? You know, what's more urgent today than it was last week or last month? And what borrowers should do now that they might be getting PPP funds? Um, before we dive into that, though, I thought maybe I'd give you a, you know, the banker perspective on this. Um, you know, this was a program that was rolled out very rapidly. You know, the president signed the CARES Act on March 27th, um, and banks were uh, to begin, you know, taking applications on, on April 3rd. Uh, it's been a huge challenge for every bank in this country to stand up this process to handle um, the application volume that could be, you know, 60 times that of a normal period. But I also understand that there's some anxiety on the part of business owners. You know, they're wondering, did they complete their application correctly? Did they submit the proper documents? Will the funds run out again? How quickly can they get their money? You know, and so every bank is being strained um, in, in, you know, getting through the, the application handling system. I can tell you that bankers are working hard to get these applications processed as quickly as possible. At Webster, as an example, we received over 6,400 applications in one week and over 8,700 overall. Um, I can personally attest, as Wendell said earlier, that those companies represent a diversity in industries and sizes and in that they indeed are Main Street businesses. You know, our customers were able to apply through our digital application portal where they were able to upload their supporting documents directly to us. And at Webster, we've redeployed and trained up upwards of uh, 300 people across the bank to process these loan requests. And in addition to that, um, our fantastic IT team has been working literally around the clock on projects that will help us move these um, applications quickly, accurately, and efficiently. But, you know, each file must be looked at to verify that the SBA application is complete by reviewing uh, businesses' loan calculations and reviewing their payroll documentation. And each package does have to get uploaded to the SBA through their application portal for approval. And then, of course, we'll have to fund all these loans. Um, we're actually doing that electronically with e-signatures, um, and then businesses get funded shortly after that. So it sounds like it's uh, just an easy, easy task, but uh, it hasn't been. But we're 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 doing our best uh, on behalf of our 8,700 applicants. So the best advice I want to give, you know, business owners who may be listening. You know, if you have an application in process at your bank, be patient, stay calm while they get these loans through their system, uh, and answer their call if they need additional information that's required to make your application successful. 
you know, so many business owners in the audience may have already been approved and some may have received funds. So, so what now, you know, what do we need to know now? Um, you know, you should know that the banks are obviously making their way through approvals and getting these loans funded as quickly as possible. Um, what may be more urgent today? Um, focus on obviously getting the funding and getting, if, if you have, you know, employees that have been, you know, furloughed, get them back to work and on the payroll as soon as possible. And, you know, what, what to do now that you have the fund. Um, Drew, uh, my good friend Drew is going to talk about the forgiveness process later, but it's not, it's, it's time to start immediately when you receive the PPP funds to have a calculation of how all of that money was spent tracking your payroll expenses for the eight weeks following your funding uh, tracking any utility and rent payments um, along with having you know canceled checks or evidence of ACH payments available uh, to to be able to submit to your lender uh, after the eight week period is up and when the forgiveness period begins so you know again we it's 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 shifted right from making sure that applications are in to now what, what happens now that the applications have been um, processed and, and money start to flow. So um, I'll stop there, Greg. I know that there are some questions that you had as well as from um, folks that are participating. So I'll, I'll stop the remarks there and maybe if you have any questions, we can get to that later. Thanks, Tim. And uh, now Taylor Shea, you're up. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, as I mentioned during our, our last webinar, things are evolving uh, rapidly, um, and the new PPP guidance continues to be issued, you know, on a regular basis, including, you know, the recent guidance issued by, um, by the SBA with respect to the economic need certification in the PPP loan application, um, which is what we heard a bit about earlier from Wendell. Um, and so this has been a hot button issue for, for many of our clients and, and most PPP applicants. Um, and so it's worth taking a few minutes to unpack it a bit. Um, so the PPP loan application requires all potential borrowers to certify that the current economic uncertainty makes the loan request necessary to support the applicant's ongoing business operations. Um, and as I noted during our last webinar, there was not a lot of clarity surrounding the certification, except that we knew it needed to be made in good faith. Um, however, last Thursday in FAQ number 31, the SBA cautioned prospective borrowers that they must carefully assess their economic need for a PPP loan. Um, this new requirement is also retrospective, which means that it applies to borrowers who made the certification previously, um, you know, before the new guidance was issued. Um, but there is a safe harbor so that if a borrower repays the loan in full by May 7th, uh, 2020, their original certification will be deemed to have been made in good faith, um, no questions asked. Um, you know, so, so what does this new guidance say? Um, it says that a company must take into account their current business activity and their ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support their ongoing operations in a manner that is not significantly detrimental to the business. Uh, and that comes right from FAQ number 31. Um, and so publicly traded companies are used in this FAQ as an example of entities that are not likely to have the requisite economic need for a loan. But the rub here is really that the guidance is not limited to these types of public companies. Instead, it appears to be equally applicable to all companies. So, you know, understandably, many concerns have been raised regarding how this guidance should be interpreted and applied. Um, unfortunately, given the circumstances, there are, you know, there's no precedent here because this is all uncharted territory for everyone, including the government and the SBA. And so all we really have to go on right now is the certification language in the application and, you know, this one FAQ, you know, unless additional guidance is issued. Um, but some factors that companies should probably be considering are EBITDA projections and cash reserves. Um, you know, if you're projecting that you will have, or in fact, you do have, you know, reserves sufficient um, to be able to pay employees, that may weigh against you. But, you know, we think the totality of the circumstances should be considered. And so, you know, if that cash is restricted or if using it would jeopardize operations or significantly exhaust the business's resources, you know, then maybe you have sufficient need for a PPP loan. Um, additionally, you know, businesses should consider whether they have the ability to obtain other capital quickly enough to be able to use it to pay employees. You know, and if you do, then, you know, the next question becomes, you know, whether there are strings attached or other costs to that liquidity. We don't know exactly what significantly detrimental means, you know, and, but not all capital is the same. And so if the liquidity you have access to would be costly or detrimental to the business, then, then access to that capital loan may not disqualify you. 
Um, but again, there's no precedent and, and there's still many open questions regarding the certification, just given the speed at which everything's unfolding. Um, but what we do know is that public companies with substantial market value and access to capital markets are unlikely to qualify. We also know that the PPP is not intended for conventional private equity or hedge funds, which is consistent with the affiliation rules I discussed during the last webinar. And we know that the certification must be made in good faith after the borrower has assessed its actual economic need. So, you know, what's the practical takeaway? Um, you know, do a thoughtful factual analysis based on the current guidance and, and then document it. You know, of course there are open questions and we're all asking the same ones, but at the end of the day, you'll need to be able to pass the sniff test. You know, so review your projections and gather objective data to demonstrate your need and keep a file with that documentation, you know, regarding that analysis in the event you are audited because there will be significant government oversight with respect to PPP loans. Um, you know, there'll be considerable government oversight here for, for a few reasons. You know, first, you know, the SBA normally relies on lenders auditing the small business loans that, that the SBA backs, but um, the PPP needed to be rolled out so quickly that Congress significantly lessened the traditional review and underwriting requirements for lenders. Um, and so second, you know, with increased spending comes increased oversight, right? And so we saw an additional $310 billion pour into the, into the program recently. Um, and, you know, the CARES Act itself provides funding and resources for government oversight and investigations, and, and we can expect that they will be implemented. And as was um, mentioned earlier, you know, we, there's been an announcement that the SBA will perform, you know, a full review of any loan over $2 million. And we also know that, you know, random audits will be done for smaller loans. And, you know, there is liability if borrowers improperly certify that, you know, they're eligible for loans. So, you know, again, we recommend all applicants to do a careful analysis based on what we know and build an audit file to evidence it. Um, and so what are the potential risks of making an incorrect certification? Obviously, fraud and bad faith will carry significant consequences. But what about the small business that simply misinterpreted the, you know, the limited guidance available? Um, you know, the SBA is definitely not, you know, out to get companies who use the program for purposes of keeping people employed and saving their small business operations. You know, you should obviously take the certifications very seriously because there are real risks, but, um, but keep in mind that, um, you know, the program is there and if you're in, in the spirit of, of the program, you know, that will weigh in, in your favor. Um, but for the potential exposure, there is potential liability under the False Claims Act, you know, and under that actual knowledge is, is not required. You can, um, legally knowledge can be found if a person acts in reckless disregard or deliberate you know, ignorance of the truth. So if a company makes certifications as to its eligibility without doing proper due diligence, that could trigger liability. Um, and then it's worth briefly noting that each application is also subject to potential public disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. We've obviously seen some negative press out there recently. And so there is um, you know, that sort of reputational risk as well. So, you know, there will be oversight and PPP applicants should not lose sight of those potential risks, but it's also important to remember that the main focus of oversight investigations will likely be into bad actors for outright right fraud, you know, not the companies that diligently executed their responsibilities and came to incorrect but genuine misunder, you know, misinterpretations of the PPP requirements. So, Remember, the, re the requirements are evolving constantly and businesses need to stay current and reassess their position as new guidance is issued. But, you know, the, the real final takeaway is to do an informal, uh, sorry, an informed and factual, you know, objective analysis, document it, save that documentation, and remember to act diligently and in good faith, you know, at all stages. Thank you, Taylor. Um, Drew, you're up. Thank you. Um, I've kind of uh, moved away from the um, application process and moved more toward the loan forgiveness strategies that with my clients and we've been advising them for the last week or so. Um, what I think is key is that I've been doing this is one, there's a lot, a lot of guidance out there on forgiveness yet that has been issued by the Treasury or the SBA. So there is some grayness within the interpretation of the law. So I've uh, been working with clients within those parameters, but what I think is really key is you need to have a loan forgiveness strategy that's um, to your unique situation. So I, as I've done this with, I can't even imagine, I, I lose track of how many people I've talked to about this, but I think we've, I've come up a number of times with different scenarios and it's not a one size fits all. So I think you really need to think about it and, and get to your advisors and run, run the strategy behind them. 
The second thing I think you need to do as part of this forgiveness strategy is to really develop a, a business strategy for the future. As we've heard earlier, the, the, you know, the forecast for the next quarter is gloomier than it, than it was for the last quarter. So eight weeks is the covered period for the loan and eight weeks goes quick. So after eight weeks, you need to look at where you're going to be and how you're going to be able to pay your people and keep your business running absent any other um, stimulus from the government, which, which um, you know, may happen or may not happen. But I think that's really key. And I've really worked a, a number of times with a lot of my clients on that going forward. And the third thing is just the general business challenges, which is part of the business strategy to cash flow and, and, and looking at cost reduction management, not necessarily around payroll, but around all costs, looking at alternative methods of funding after the, the period that you get have the loan, such as bank funding or outside sources or other investors, do some workforce planning on where you're going. And just just be cognizant of all the future uncertainty around the economy going in the next quarter. And hopefully we're talking about rebounding in the third and fourth, but that's yet to be known as, as we know, every day we wake up and there's a new challenge. I, I, so to, so to speak, to tell people, and I feel, feel for myself, I, you know, we've been talking about this loan since March 27th, which is already a month. And it's still kind of got a lot of greatness around some of the, some of the provisions, especially around the forgiveness. So the other thing I've been recommending is once there is guidance on the forgiveness, the clients that have already received the money may need to re look at their strategy for forgiveness and may have to make some adjustments around that. Thank you, Drew. Now I'm going to open up to Q and A for, for all panelists. Um, first I'll just do some targeted questions, but anybody who wants to answer could feel free to step in. Um, after that, uh, Drew, just since we left off with you, <clears throat> do you have a sense of when there will be detailed forgiveness uh, guidelines? When will they when will they be published? I, th I thought they'd be out this week, but I haven't seen anything yet. And and uh, I think the second round of funding has caused maybe a little bit of delay of that. So uh, hopefully soon, because people are get the money and as soon as the day you've received the money is when your eight weeks period starts. So you have to kind of really utilize the funds appropriately from day one to really maximize forgiveness. Sure. Wendell, do you have a sense of when those forgiveness guidelines will be published? Craig, I was happy you asked through that question because I sound like a broken record on that. Um, Thank you. I don't. I like, I like Drew woke up Monday morning expecting to see the additional guidance and now I'm here I am on Wednesday without it. You know, with that being said, I, I mean, there was some definition around um, payroll expenses and, and there is, you know, there's some clarity overall. I mean, if, you, if you're utilizing a for payroll and payroll expenses, then you're obviously clear. But I think, you know, the accountants in the world and the attorneys, they come up with very good questions when you get granular with some of the, with some of the uh, expenses that are out there. But generally speaking, though, I mean, there's, there's guidance out there, which I think can at least direct you in the right direction. I think that's where folks are going. Uh, with that being said, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that it's today and tomorrow when I wake up. And if it hasn't happened today, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping it's tomorrow. Sure. We'll get to more questions on forgiveness in a minute, because that seems to be a key question that a lot of our, our listeners have on their mind. But um, before we get there, uh, Tim, can you talk a little bit about, um, has Webster Bank made any changes in the way it, it's handling loan applications during the second round uh, of funding? And how are you prioritizing your, your loan applications? Uh, all our loans were processed in the order in which they were received, and we've made no changes to that in the second round, Greg. Okay. And can you give us, did Webster have any technical glitches with this second round and have those been worked out at this point? Um, the first few days, as Wendell alluded to, the SBA system was, I think, a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, you know, it, it's now had two rounds of record application submission. So yes, there was a lot of system slowness, um, but that seemed to kind of work itself out by the third day. Sure. Uh, um, Taylor, a lot of people I think have that with that new 
language on the necessity and need risk assessment. What, what are you sort of certification? What are you sort of telling your clients and, and what, what are they, what questions are they bringing to you on that? Um, you know, cause there's a lot of people who maybe have applied for loans and gotten the money already. And then they're looking at this, this new guidance and they're saying, Oh, it might be a little bit murky for them in terms of if they're going to be able to have their, their loan forgiven. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that's definitely one of the main questions that we've been seeing from our clients. I mean, I think, you know, and everybody, including people that have received funds, right, because it is retroactive and they have a short period of time, you know, until May 7th to sort of exercise and return the money if they think it's necessary. I mean, I think at the end of the day, most of my clients have come out comfortable with their original assessment, um, you know, and the hard thing is that we're all sort of in the same boat here, you know, and there's a little bit of, of you know, uh, uncertainty, just again, given the reality that everything has been moving so fast. Um, but ultimately, I tell them, you know, do an objective analysis, you know, look at all your actual factual information and create a, you know, uh, an audit file, as I mentioned, so that, you know, if you do get questioned as to, to where you came out, you know, you have to have a good faith, you know, certification. And, and so if you can say that with a straight face, and you have a sort of an honorable position there, you know, I think, I think that's really what's going to be most important. Again, you know, the SBA is not going to be looking to go after people that genuinely misinterpret something, you know, but, but people obviously need to be mindful of, of sort of this heightened um, certification because it is, it is more than, than what we knew originally. Hey, Greg, uh, Wendell Davis, just if I literally just got a, a, a bulletin on my computer, it's not with regards to forgiveness, but I think it's an important notice. Effective 4 p.m. today through midnight, uh, the SBA system will only accept loans from lending institutions with asset sizes less than $1 billion. So that's just for today, uh, starting at 4 p.m. And again, I think it goes back to the point I was making earlier. And one of the reasons for the slowdown on Monday was they want to make sure there's equal footing for all lenders, no matter the size. And so this is the smallest of the small. And they're giving them a window, uh, again, from 4 to midnight today to get their applications in. And so just to reiterate that, Wendell, you said only banks with uh, less than a billion assets or less are going to be able to file? Applications from 4 p.m. today through midnight. Okay. If you're a, a small business right now that has an application at a bank with more than a billion dollars in assets, uh, should you try to scurry along and, and file another application with a smaller bank if possible? I, um, you know, I, I, <laughs> it's a great question, right? You know, I know in speaking with Webster, who's on the phone right here, I mean, I don't think they have a backlog right now. So this, that, that's a window for those smaller banks. The other banks will be able to get their applications through today. And then I know the folks at Webster and the other banks are working from midnight till eight in the morning. So they're not sleeping at night. So um, I, I don't think you can go wrong. But there is this window just to make sure the smallest of small are being reached. Sure. And then, uh, Tim, maybe this question is, is for you. How long should it take for businesses to find out uh, whether their application has been accepted and then how long before they actually get the money? Generally speaking, um, the, the bank will take the application, process it, submit it to SBA. And once we get the SBA approval back, the funding generally takes place within 10 days after the SBA approval date. Sure. Uh, Drew, what kind of detailed record keeping of payroll or income um, should companies uh, do to, in order to uh, show that they've been able to meet the loan forgiveness criteria? Well, I would suggest that you keep your uh, payroll tax records, your payroll registers, your pay by employee to ensure that you didn't reduce the pay by more than 25% for full-time equivalents and you haven't paid anyone over the uh, annual salary of 100,000 um, and to keep state unemployment information and tax returns. So it's basically all your payroll registers that you should have, if you use a third party payroll service or you should have those records readily available. 
Sure. Um, I'm going to do a, some questions now from, from the audience. Um, and a lot of these are, are related to, to loan forgiveness. So uh, I'm going to read the question. Anybody who wants to answer could, could step in. Um, so one person says, I'm nearing the end of the eight-week loan forgiveness period. Can I give bonus to staff to ensure 75% of the PP funds are spent on payroll costs? I... I, I think this is one of those questions that goes back to the guidance issued by the Treasury. It doesn't say you can't, but the question becomes, should you give more than what you normally would give during eight weeks? That's what I think is kind of gray in my mind. Mm -hmm. Taylor, did you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, no, I agree with that. I think this is one of the open issues. We don't have any hard guidance against it, but but because of how fast everything is evolving, you know, it wouldn't be surprising to have additional guidance come out that will weigh in on that one way or the other. Um, but I will say that, that the guidance that we're getting, it, it typically allows for sort of retroactive, you know, we're not, there hasn't been any penalty of somebody who has followed the guidance as of that day. Obviously anything can change, but, but the best you can do is follow the guidance that, that's available to you today. Okay. I've also um, heard some, some discussion around you give a bonus, but maybe you lower their pay going forward. Okay. Which I would think is a little bit aggressive. Sure. Um, here, here's another question. Uh, on the PPP application, we're asked to break out payroll, fringe, utilities, and lease expenses. Is there flexibility within these amounts as long as we aren't expending more than 25% uh, in non-payroll costs? utility costs aren't fixed from month to month. Yeah, I, I think it, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Payroll, payroll just needs to be 75%. The payroll costs would include fringe, any retirement plan contributions would, would include, of fringes, it would include health insurance and retirement plan contributions. The rest would be more interest on mortgage debt, rent or on lease payments and um, utility payments. And right now there's no restriction or requirement for how that 25% is allocated, you know, amongst those yeah. categories that Drew just mentioned, so long as it, you know, all, they're all permitted expenses. Sure. When calculating payroll for forgiveness and the PPP loan, are payroll tax payments included? Um, not empl like not the employer, taxes, right? employer share of payroll taxes, just the uh, employee share. Okay. Um, after, after appropriately using the loan proceeds during the eight-week period, will subsequent cutting of staff impact the PPP loan? Doesn't say so. Mm. Not as of now. Okay. And uh, Taylor, this one is probably geared towards you. What happens if a company gets a loan, meets the requirements, but ends up going out of business? What liabilities might there be for the company or the business owner? Yeah, well, I mean, so so you're not eligible if you're currently in bankruptcy, you know, but if we're talking about a situation where a business, you know, applied for the loan and, and thereafter, you know, is not able to satisfy it, obviously the SBA has it has the loan back, but, you know, I would imagine it would go into work out, you know, just as, as any other loan would, um, you know, obviously there's no collateral here, but, um, you know, I don't think we have real clear guidance as it how it would proceed other than, than as a traditional workout would be unless there was some sort of fraud or, or if they were you know, already going into bankruptcy proceedings, in which case you're not eligible. Sure. Uh, Tim, is Webster still receiving uh, uh, new applications at this point? What, what's your sort of thoughts on that? Uh, we are considering new applications. Uh, those that we believe are, are complete have all the information that, that is needed. Um, but again, we can't guarantee 100% success on those, um, given the fact that, that we don't know. Uh, uh, we now heard uh, what Wendell said about um, other institutions having an open window, and we don't know whether or not it'll reopen after midnight for, for all lenders. So, you know, again, I can't give a 100% uh, you know, certain answer that that application will be successful. You know, it, it will depend on whether or not it's opened back up and if the money runs out. Sure. Uh, Wendell, I have a question for you. Uh, besides the PPP, what other programs are available through the CARES Act that small businesses can take advantage of? Yeah, and just so I can clarify uh, what Tim was just talking about, it will, it, the, the 
bulletin I did get made it clear that it will open up after that time period to all other lenders. However, I mean, I think uh, Tim's point is accurate. Uh, you know, nobody can get when the money's going to run out. So that that is a risk. And then I'm sorry, so the other programs, I mean, right now, yeah. obviously, the focal point is the, the PPP program. I have a question on IDLE. Uh, that's still a program out there, right? That, that The IDLE program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, did run out of money. It just got refunded as part of that CARES Act. Uh, there was also some guidance on that, uh, opening it up to um, farmers and farm-related businesses. So it's, it's, it's broader now. It's anticipated that that portal is going to open up again, so that may be another avenue. The traditional loan products of the SBA, the 7A flagship program, is still out there. And right now, if you do get a 7A loan, uh, there is deferral for the first six months of uh, any payments on that. Uh, so there are traditional programs that the SBA has that are available. And anybody can reach out to the district office or folks like Webster Bank that know our our loan portfolio and our loan programs inside out. Sure. And uh, the emergency disaster loans, is that, is that open up? Uh, I know there's been money allocated for it. Is that open up? Are they taking applications for it right now? It is not right now, uh, but that, it, that will happen. As well. Okay. And, and Wendell, what's your sense that more funding will, will be allocated again for the PPP program after this $310 billion runs out? Yeah, and I have to give you my stock answer for that because we're an executive agency. You know, our job is to take what Congress did and then implement and execute on that. Uh, so the, the the policymakers, the congressional folks, I mean, that's a that that's their decision, not mine. Sure, and I'll just note that. Um, yep, sorry, did somebody? It's David Lehman. I I, yeah. I, I, I don't have the uh, encumbrance that uh, Wendell does, so I, I can sure. speculate on this one. We we looked at so round numbers. There's ninety thousand businesses in the state of Connecticut that are under roughly a hundred employees, and eighteen thousand, as was mentioned, got it the first time. It seems like the, the loan balance is going to be smaller this time. So maybe there's twenty or twenty five thousand. Again, that's speculation, but I think you could see a scenario where forty or forty five thousand of Connecticut's ninety thousand businesses have this. So that's roughly half by business count. If you look at employee payroll. You know, we think that upwards of 75% of the businesses, again, with this two months holding that constant, which I realize is a key assumption, but we think upwards of, of, of three quarters of the small business employees in the state could be under a PPP loan if they get rehired. And that's the big question. Do they stay uh, on unemployment or do they get rehired to make the loan forgivable as you guys have been debating? So I guess my point is I, th I could see the, you know, I've seen estimates upwards of a trillion of total demand. But I, I think it, after this tranche, assuming we get what we should get, you could see somewhere we're close to three quarters of the businesses have gotten what they need for those two months with the big caveat that some of them might be uh, ha have the trouble of not being able to reopen or rehire, which um, I think could, could th throw some sand in the gears. So I think we're pretty close, but we, we'd be a proponent of a bit more funding. But I think after this 310, we're in a, in a much better spot than we were. Sure, and I'll note that uh, Representative uh, Rosa DeLora on a call yesterday with the New Haven Chamber of Commerce said she thinks that there will be a, three, a third round of funding, and that's going to be one of her priorities over the next um, few weeks. And, and da David, while I've got you uh, on the line, what else do you think the federal government ought to do to stimulate the economy or, and or you know, what should the state be doing and, and what does the state plan to do uh, maybe later in, this year, later in the year to, in terms of a state-based stimulus program? Yeah. So listen, I, 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 I'd, I'd rate the federal response extremely highly, um, both from a fiscal perspective and a monetary perspective. Right? We can debate, we're, we, you know, we're spe we basically have spent 15% of GDP or three, close to $3 trillion now, uh, which is unprecedented stimulus. And obviously that is uh, not good in terms of future generations and more debt that the country has. But outside of that, the, the federal government reacted very quickly and decisively. You could debate some of these are blunt instruments and, and there's the issues like we've talked about with the Lakers and Shake Shack, et cetera, on, on PPP. In addition, the, the Federal Reserve's response in terms of asset purchases and, and reducing the cost of capital out there has also been tremendous. So I, I think the federal response overall has been awesome. Um, certainly if there is more targeted stimulus um, for an additional tranche, I think that makes sense. But I, I think that the amount of stimulus and the amount of kind of safety net, if you will, has been really, really significant. On the state side, uh, we are absolutely gonna be focused on recovery. So that third you node, know, once we get to reopen, and I think that is gonna take some time, but recovery is the next step. And I, and I think there's gonna need to be 
careful consideration alongside of the federal response. You know, for example, one thing we haven't discussed a lot is infrastructure. We, we would be a proponent and we believe that the federal government's gonna be pushing large infrastructure projects to get, to get the economy going again. But the state's gonna to look to complement um, you know, the federal government as it relates to incentivizing investment and job creation. Because if we have a 20% plus or minus unemployment rate, that's just not acceptable. And we wanna make sure that we get our economy going as fast as possible. And we'll be working with the legislate, legislators on that. Sure, thank you. I wanna end it with one more question because I think this is an important one. Um, it's from a restaurant, but I think this applies to other companies that have been closed um, over the last few weeks or months. Um, how can restaurants maximize loan forgiveness while stay at home orders are limiting our operations? Um, anybody wanna give that one a, a try, Taylor or Drew? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think this is a really good example. I mean, I think the whole purpose of the, of the program is to uh, keep your employees. So to actually maximize forgiveness, you're going to have to, you know, hire back your employees and use the proceeds, you know, to pay for their salaries and other eligible uses, you know, during, during your covered period. Um, and so, you know, the eligible uses are those, you know, payroll costs and payment on, on any covered rent obligation. And, and we've already talked about, you know, most of those, but um, you know, I guess on this last one, we would note that the plain language, I guess, of the statute seems to suggest that um, mortgage obligation uh, a covered mortgage obligation might also include any interest payment um, on secured debt that was incurred before February 15th, 2020. So, so mortgage loans, but also traditional business loans if they're secured by personal property. We don't seem to have any hard guidance on this, but, but the plain language of the statute suggests that. But, but ultimately to maximize forgiveness, you've got to have you know, the payroll, you've got to have the payroll costs um, for 75% of that and then 25 for the other eligible uses. Yeah, I, I would agree with all that. Yeah. Yeah. When, if I could just chime in. Um, I, yeah, I agree with everything that uh, Taylor just said. The, I would add one thing because I'm hearing this a lot as I travel through, I travel throughout New England, I actually travel by, by uh, phone or computer throughout New England, <laughs> is that kind of counterintuitive for small businesses that they, they want to hire back their employees, but they may not have work uh, for them, especially with the shelter uh, in place rules that are out there. They, they actually are prohibited from bringing them back. The SBA and the Treasury understands that. And part of the goal here, again, is the Paycheck Protection Program, is one to make sure that that relationship between the employer, the small business, and the employee is maintained through this eight week period. So the SBA understands you may not hire that you're going to hire them back, but you may not have work for them. That is really counterintuitive for small business owners. They're like, ah, you know, I can't, I can hire them, but there's no work for them. So why would I hire them? We understand that. So you're still eligible. It's not going to preclude a small business from getting that forgiveness. We want to maintain that relationship and that structure, that business structure that's in place throughout our economy. Sure. Thank you for that, Wendell. Um, we're, we're heading towards the end of our program today, so I'd like to wrap up today's session by thanking our sponsors for joining us as well as our panelists. Uh, for listeners who are looking for more information, please check our website at hartfordbusiness.com for continuing coverage of the PPP program, as well as the coronavirus's impact on the greater Hartford economy. At our website under the HBJ Events tab, if you click on the webinars, you'll also soon find a recording of today's session, as well as numerous resources for businesses that want more details about the PPP program, as well as other programs to provide support for small businesses. Thank you for joining us and be on the lookout for more HBJ webinars in the weeks ahead, including some healthcare industry. Thank you and have a good rest of the day.